I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to Bigfoot, America's Creek Devil. We're going to interview Chuck in a moment with some recent activity and things he had going on in Oklahoma. But Tom, would you like to make an announcement first? I would. I, As usual, I want to thank everybody who is tuning in and listening, and uh, we appreciate it. Um, and if you want to, you guys know what to do. If you like the show, let us know. You just click the like button and the subscribe if you haven't done that already. And if you want somebody else to hear it, uh, just click the share button and send it to one of your friends by text or email. And you can really take it to the next level with, uh, if you want to, there's a link in the Patreon, excuse me, a link in the YouTube description to Patreon for as little as a dollar a month or whatever you want to do. You can support us and that helps us to help you. And, uh, or you can just go to Patreon forward slash Creek Devil. And that's another way of doing it. So, uh, anyway, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. And I think you're going to like today's show. Yeah, we really appreciate, you know, people hitting that like button. I guess that's what um, gets the shows out into the feeds of other people, uh, you know, in their recommendations. So, uh, if you could do that small thing for us, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to be doing, you know, as Tom and I have talked about in the past, um, we have sort of a 5% uh, improvement <clears throat> policy that we do. And we, we constantly, we're trying to make things better for you, the listeners. And um, since I'm retired from my working life now and not retired from this topic, I'm going to be stepping up things in this topic. Uh, we're going to be adding to the shows and actually adding a show each week. Um, I'm going to be doing some a little vacationing here, though, in the next month or so. Uh, so we probably won't see those new additions until, oh, I don't know, Tom, we, we haven't talked about it yet, but probably not until September, so uh, maybe even October. So uh, with that said, you know, watch for those changes, and we'll have some interesting things coming for you. So, uh, Chuck, you had some really interesting things go on here recently. You want to tell us about those? Sure. Um, <clears throat> it all started about two weeks ago. Uh, I had a buddy of mine came to my house and got me out of the house. And uh, we went to a location uh, kind of northwest of me, uh, went to a lake. And um, I'd been out there quite a bit. I've seen a lot of stuff out there, tree structures, all kinds of structures, TP structures, X structures, and stuff like that out there. And um, we, we kind of looked at uh, around different several different areas around the lake area and uh saw some stuff some tree breaks some bends and uh some arches a couple of x uh x uh, x structures and stuff like that and uh, as the day progressed we decided on, on the north side of the lake there there's it's a, a wildlife management area and there's lots of activity out there. There's been all kinds of, of things happen out there, and people have seen Bigfoot out there in this area. So we went to the north side of the lake, and uh, it was getting getting pretty dark. And um, the guy that drove me out there backed his pickup up close to uh, one of the boat ramps there. And to, to give you some kind of picture of this area, uh, it's real thick, a lot of woods, a lot of brush, and the lake right there is uh, ha has these boat docks, but the water there is, is only about probably three foot deep. And so we, he backed his pickup up to the end of the boat ramp, and and I was sitting in the passenger seat, and of course because of my eye situation that I've had and the surgeries that I've had, I decided that I was going to stay in the truck because I didn't think it was smart enough for me to 
be walking around uh, in the dark uh, with my my eyes the way they were. So I sat in the truck and I had my audio recorder and he had his audio recorder and uh, we put them on top of the on top of the truck and started started recording. And uh, I had come up with a device that made some really decent calls and a buddy of mine had told me about it and i i ended up buying one of these this thing and so uh, i've been dying to get it out in the woods to uh use this device to see if i get the kind of reaction that i'm hoping to get for and uh so i turned turned this on and and um we made a call and uh almost instantly after the first call we start hearing um what sounds like bullfrogs uh but it didn't sound like a bullfrog uh it was very unique um kind of weird sounding bullfrog and the thing about bullfrogs especially out here on this lake uh when the bullfrogs are out you don't just hear two of them you hear hundreds of them out there croaking and this particular situation this particular night there was only two of them and um they were croaking back and forth and i looked at him and he looked at me and he he told me he said i've never heard bullfrog sound like that and i said well neither have i that's it's kind of kind of strange well he walked around the truck a little bit and i i was sitting in the truck and i had my headphones on uh, my audio recorder and I was listening to the audio and uh, the crazy thing about these these bullfrogs was that they kept getting closer and closer to her to us and we sat there and we listened for a while then he decided he was going to make a call so he made a call and when he made the call what we started hearing was what sounded like uh, what sounded like something was walking in the water coming toward us. And again, on where these boat ramps are out, probably 50 yards or 60 yards away, there's, there's these islands out there. And, um, these islands are, they got real tall cattails and lots of brush on these islands and, and stuff like that. So that's the direction that these, these footsteps were were coming toward us you could tell that these were bipedal footsteps and as i'm sitting there listening to the recorder it sounds like whatever this is is taking one step at a time in very slow uh, movement but it sounds like when a person walks in the water and you you the water splashes up against their legs or whatever you hear that 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 splash and that's that's kind of what we were hearing and um as time went by these things obviously were were becoming closer and closer and closer to us and where on my side of the pickup where i was sitting there was the wood line is right there right next to where we were parked and that area is, is, is pretty brushy, a lot of trees. Um, and so it, there's a lot of foliage right there and very, very dark. Uh, that night, I think maybe there was maybe 36% light uh, at, that, at that time. So we didn't have a lot of light and it, it's dark, dark, dark out there. We didn't, we didn't have lights other than headlamps. And, uh, so I, de- I decided that I was going to make a third call and I made the third call. And, uh, soon after I made the third call in the wood line, I start hearing footsteps coming toward me. And, you know, I, I've been around these things a lot. Um, I've taken pictures and casted prints and all that kind of stuff and done, done the research and still doing research. And, um, 
I, uh, I have never, ever felt like I was in any kind of danger until that night. Um, these things were definitely coming closer and closer to us. And I just felt this overwhelming sense that if we didn't get out of there pretty soon, we were going to be in trouble. And, um, as time went by, uh, that feeling kept getting worse and worse and worse. And finally he come in and sit down beside me in the pickup. And, and I told him, I said, you know what, we got to get out of here and we got to get, we've got to get out of here now. Uh, and he said, you think so? And I said, yeah, I know. So I said, I've got that sixth sense feeling that we're in trouble. And if we don't get out of here now, we're going to be in real trouble. And, um, he told me he was going to step out of the pickup and get, put his headlamp on and, uh, walk out by the dock and to see if he could see anything out there because we, we still were hearing these steps coming toward us that sounded like they were coming across the island and, and up toward us where we were. And so, uh, I, I, uh, I had the window rolled down in the pickup and, uh, was sitting there. And as I was sitting there, he was walking toward the back part of the truck and he, he, he turned on his, his, uh, headlamp. And when he turned on his headlamp, um, he saw a Bigfoot that was standing probably 10 feet from the bank and, uh, according to what he told me, he said this thing was probably eight or nine feet tall. And with his, with his headlamp shining in this Bigfoot's face, uh, he saw red eye shine. And right after he saw the eye shine, uh, this thing actually ducked his head down against his chest and he lost sight of the eye shine, but he could still see the, the silhouette. And, uh, he started backing up toward the front of the truck. And as he was turning to come toward the truck, he looked over on my side of the truck. And when he looked over on my side of the truck, there was another one that was standing on my side of the truck, uh, toward the, the back of the truck and walking my direction. And I reached up, I, I, I never saw it but I reached up to grab my recorder off the top of the truck. And when I did, uh, we heard a growl. And, um, so he, when he saw that and heard the growl, uh, he jumped in the truck and, and we got out of there. And I, I, I feel like if we would have waited any longer than what we did, we would have been, we would have been in, in trouble, big time trouble. And, um, so we got out of there and we talked about it the very next day and listened to the audio that we had collected on our recorders. And you can definitely hear the footsteps coming in through the water and, and these frogs, these two frogs, um, kept getting closer and closer to us as well. And the more and more we talked about it, the more and more we felt like it wasn't just two of them out there. There was probably one or two more that was in the same area. And, um, it was, it was a really, for me, it was a really eye opening experience because like I said, I've, I've never felt, uh, the kind of danger, uh, that I felt that night. I just knew that we didn't get out of there. We were going to be in trouble. Hey, Chuck. Yes, sir. Hey, had they ever shown you any aggression like that before, or was this like something new that you weren't expecting or what? Well, you know, there's a place that I go to in, in uh, Southeastern Oklahoma and there's a cabin there. And the only other experience that I've, I've had that it wasn't really alarming. Um, but we've had times out there at that cabin uh, staying out there where in the middle of the night, two or three o'clock in the morning, you'll hear something, uh, jingling the door handle in the, in the front part of the cabin. And, and we've heard them walk up the deck too at night that late 
and um and and i've had rocks thrown at me at the cabin before and uh of course first forrest and i kind of have kind of talked about that and uh of course the big joke is that <laughs> there's a female and we know there's a female bigfoot there i casted a track there and uh she's been seen several times and um the joke is that she's got a crush on me or something and uh so anyway uh that's the only other time where i've ever had something like that happen uh i did work in the oil field for a while and there was a place that i went uh at night uh to to put diesel in the generator to to continue making the pumps work and uh twice while i i've driven up on this hill to get to the generator i've had tree limbs thrown at me um uh, and that's you know that's not far from where i live it's uh it's probably about 10 or 12 miles away uh where where i was working and i've had experiences like that at night uh out there and i've also had an experience where one night i heard uh three screams and uh and that was at a completely different oil field spot. But that was the first time, uh, to be honest, that I've ever felt any kind of fear that we were in trouble. Uh, that's never happened to me before. And, I, and I've been pretty close to them. I mean, I had one when I went on the first expedition I ever went on down in southeast or uh, in southern Texas in the Big Thicket area, or Sam Houston National Forest. I actually had one looking in my window one night about three o'clock in the morning. And it, I I wasn't at that time. I wasn't really, I just started getting into this subject and uh, I, uh, I really didn't know what to do other than uh, for me to lay back down in my, in my truck seat and act like I was asleep. Uh, That was the only thing I could think of at the time. And uh, I did. And waited about two minutes and I leaned back up and looked out the window and it was gone. Uh, but I, I wasn't really at that point in time, I really wasn't as, as scared as I was the other night. Uh, and, and that's to put it pretty bluntly. Do you think it was reacting to maybe because somebody was with you? I, you know, I really don't think that was it. I, I think I, I had heard about this call from a buddy of mine that actually owns the cabin down in southeastern Oklahoma, and uh, he told me about it. And he had an experience at the cabin and uh, used the same device and on the back part of the porch. And instantly... Uh, down there he got three responses from three different directions and uh it it he had never ever heard anything like that before and he ended up going into the cabin and uh turning on the tv and started watching tv and he said he told me he said within 30 minutes uh of staying in the cabin he said i felt uh he said that every hair on my arm stood up and and the hair on my leg stood up and he said uh, the first thing that came to my mind was I felt. Huh. Well, Chuck, I'm going to jump in here. Oh, uh, I think we lost <laughs> Chuck. <laughs> uh oh. Right, let me find out what's going on. Oops. It was like the call dropped. Yeah, let me find out what's going on here. Um, let's see where. Well, he and I have both been having terrible. Uh oh. Doggone it. This thing is just... Okay. David got dropped off, too. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Uh-oh. Tom, I think Forrest is gone, too. Stop. What I'm here. in the world? Yep. Hey, David. Because yeah. okay. if you don't want to talk to me, just say so. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's well, easier to do it this way. I, you know, <laughs> Sorry. I, I don't know what happened with the system here. Let's see. Let me get Chuck back on here. I don't know what happened with that, but um, and I don't know why my computer decided to freak out. It's just one of those. It's just one of those mornings, I guess. You know, the computer well, now, decided yeah. to go. Wasn't that just 
weird. Hello. Hey, Chuck. <laughs> Everybody just hey. kind of got dropped off all of a sudden, except uh, except me and Forrest and Tom. <laughs> No, wow. it dropped. Uh, uh, Will it dropped me too? Oh, okay. I mean, I, as soon as I said something about uh, Chuck and I were having uh, problems with our phones last night, remember Chuck? I mean, uh, we were discussing yeah. that, and I mean, as soon as that came out of my mouth, uh, the phone, my phone went dead. Uh, y'all, well, you can't had talk about it. those things. <laughs> okay, no. I, I promise. <laughs> you know. <clears throat> Hey, if they apparently just it quiet, irritates somebody or something. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, if they just be quiet and listen, they'd learn a lot of things. You know. Yeah. Right. So, well, anyway. maybe <clears throat> maybe my maybe my buddy uh, cut everybody off. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Which buddy would that be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So where were we there, guys? I don't know where exactly we got dropped off. Well, but... I was going to make a comment. <laughs> okay, go right ahead, Forrest. And all this, I almost forgot what the comment was. Anyway, um, Chuck, did I not warn you? And that you didn't tell them, and and I don't think you should tell them the call that you uh, used because I don't think anybody else needs to be silly and stupid like you were. No, don't and tell go that. out there and 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 do the same thing. But right. did I not right. tell you? before you went out there that you were asking for trouble and you went ahead and did it anyway, just like a naughty little boy. And, um, <laughs> and, and that was exactly what your friend and, uh, Hanobi did the same thing. That was the same call that he, uh, uh, you know, put out. Yeah. And that's, and, and look what kind of response you got. There yeah. is something about that that is not, it does not uh, produce a good reaction with them. Well, so, it's, it's probably uh, it's probably a part of what Mr. Black told me. There's there's a particular way to bring the creatures in, and I'm not going to say it on the air because then everybody and his brother will be out doing it, and you'll get bad reactions because the reaction to that um, audible sound is never good. So... Exactly. That's the reason we're not going to say what it is because we don't want people in danger. Right, and, no. and that was that was my frame of mind too as well. Uh, that I, I'm number one. I, I don't think I'll ever use that again. Um, but number two, I, I didn't want to talk about <laughs> that device because um, my sense of feeling was that if, if somebody goes out there and, and doesn't really realize what the repercussions are someone's going to get hurt or somebody's going to get killed and i i uh and, and that's kind of the way i felt that night uh i i thought man there there's no way i'm going to use this thing ever again unless i've got like a big bonfire going and 10 guys with guns sitting around the campfire with me i i just i don't uh i definitely wouldn't do that again Hey, guys, I'm going to jump in in for just a second with a question to Will. And um, this is the curious. I'm I'm curious. You have felt it. Chuck has felt it. Um, I have felt the weird feeling. I think I'm just too stupid to to, uh, peg it down to uh, you need to get out of here but where do you think that comes from how does that happen where you suddenly get this vibe that you need to get out of there well you know I, I think we sense a lot more than we realize we do in terms of you know minute hearing um, you know because when you're out in an area suddenly without even realizing it and you've noticed this time when we were in the field where things will get quieter than they really should be. Because if you're out in the woods often enough, you kind of have a sense of how things should be throughout a given day. And when that right. changes, it doesn't feel right. You know, on a real base level, we kind of notice that. You and Adam noticed that the, the first time, this was two years ago, at the brush piles, where there is no, there should be a ruckus, you know, as is coming towards twilight, there's, there's normally a ruckus by the chipmunks and the squirrels and the birds and everything. 
And <clears throat> it was a proverbial silence. Yeah, there was no noise whatsoever. <laughs> it was odd for that particular yeah. time of day. It was. And we ended up getting some some good footage, but uh, the end, we ended up that day about, what, 2 o'clock in the morning getting surrounded by these things with, they weren't bullfrogs, they were owls. Um, but they weren't yeah, quite and owls. I, anyway, you, you, go ahead. I was going to. I was going to ask you guys, have you ever heard of them mimicking frogs like that? I mean, that's the first time I've ever heard that. I've heard the owls before, and I've heard strange coyote sounds before that didn't sound like coyotes. Um, but has has anybody ask, ever... Here, here's, I haven't heard that, but here's why I don't think I would eliminate them mimicking something can you mimic a frog? Sure. All of us can. If we can do it, and they're out in the, that's in their environment, I'll, I'll ask Will, I mean, what do you think, Will? Is it, is it beyond, is it stretching credibility that they could mimic frogs, that they could mimic owls and everything else? Well, I've heard from quite a number of people that say they've heard um, many different kinds of normal animal noises but they sound way off. We even have recordings of that where there's, um, oh, what's the one? It sounds like an owl, then it trails off. It doesn't stop. It's not an additional recording. Barred owl. Yeah, it sounds like an owl, then it trails off into a gurgle and kind of a growl. That is not an owl. Yeah. Well, Tom, Tom, remember the, the night that we were having the... Uh, Jessica and I were having those weird yes. uh, vibration sensations, and I mean, I was actually on the phone with you. That was the that was about the strangest thing I'd ever heard. And I think I had to be honest with you. I mean, I was going, "Are we getting hit with infrasound, or is this something that uh, somebody else is doing, like a human, or what?" And then when we went outside, and both of us went out armed, as you well know, and we were, I had literally turned to say something to Jessica, and that's when those coyotes went off, and I had you on the phone, and you heard them, and they were, yes, they, did, did. they did not sound like coyotes, and I mean, it sounded like they were like, just, <laughs> I mean, right up at the road, you know, uh, 50 yards away, so I'm like, they were you know, we were, they were close, I mean, because they were coming in loud and clear to you. Tom, I also. I mean, that yeah, was yeah. very, very disturbing. I mean, I actually, that was the first time I had ever really had a sense of fear outside my own home. Tom, I don't know if you remember that particular night also. Didn't we hear crows? Yeah. Yeah, we did. See, now crows are something. We heard something crows that, at four, four in the morning? Yeah, crows aren't out in the middle of the night. They don't, they don't make noises in the middle of the night. So when you hear that, it's not crows. You know, that area where I had that first encounter back in 2017 that prompted me to reach out to you, Will, um, <clears throat> that same area with that same buddy, we were hiking up to the top of the ridge line, and there's about a half mile, third to a half mile hike to get up to this. Well, we were going to a fire lookout, and you go through some heavily forested area. And on the downslope, which I was on the right side of the road, and to my right on the downslope, was a very, very loud owl, kind of like an owl. It was very annoying. And Buddy goes, hey, is that you doing that? Like, moron. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, five feet away You're from right you. You're right there. Does that sound <laughs> like me? <laughs> yeah, I'm right here. Oh. But I think what it was is that it was – irritating enough it just it was persistent and it was irritating and it was in the daytime now i'm not saying owls can't hoot in the daytime but it was super loud and i don't think i've ever heard them in the daytime i'd like to hear from a any biologists out there if they'd like to reach out to us and uh, say yeah they don't hoot in the daytime as a general rule but this was, anyway, I'm just, I'm, it's a long-winded way of affirming what you guys just said about the wrong noise at the wrong time. 
Well, as far as frogs go, the only time I've ever heard them imitate any type of frog was a bullfrog. And that's what that's what these sounded like. Yeah, they, it, it sounded like a big like a big bullfrog, but it, it it definitely didn't sound like the you know the bullfrogs that we hear around here. And like I said, you know that time of year, this time of year, especially on that lake. If there's frogs croaking, there's usually hundreds of them, and and this was just two two calls uh, from two different directions, right? And it, it it definitely didn't sound like a bullfrog that I've ever heard before. <clears throat> well, and Chuck, do you do remember? Now you were talking about the <laughs> incidents incidences up at uh, Hanobi that uh, when you've been up there with the, uh, yes, they tested the door and you've heard them walk around on the uh, porch and balcony and all of that. But you also, every time you've ever been up there, both you and your friend, when he's up there with his girlfriend and when you took up uh, Mary Fabian and her sister up there, uh, that was when you had the, uh, rock throwing at the house that's, so, yeah that's exactly I mean, right i mean and, it, it and, seems like there's things that that uh are catalysts with these uh beasts uh no other way to just describe them but uh there's catalysts that seem to set them off and um i think it may be different with the males and the females and you know it's just it's just bizarre. I mean, the whole thing, the fact that they exhibit emotions like they do, yeah, anger, I would jealousy. I, w- I would agree with that because I had never, you know, I was up there by myself before and had my son with me, and um, we uh, we heard the same thing that night and. But there was never any rocks thrown at us or anything like that. That never that never really happened. Um, but that the time when Mary and I were there and uh, with my buddy and his girl girlfriend, when they were there, they were there a day after we left. And the first thing he did when he got there was turn on the water, and he he smelt a rancid smell. Um, and decided he he knew exactly what it was when he when he smelt the smell and he got her in the cabin and he and her went to the cabin and within probably 20 minutes of being in the cabin uh in broad daylight here come the rocks and started hitting uh the cabin so you know i can i can relate to that i mean i i've experienced that before so it was just a strange strange event for me and Mary and her sister and and a uh, strange event for him as well. So, well, what I want to throw out there is, and, and I think we've kind of uh, briefly discussed this before, but you've got these situations where I mean, you've heard of uh, bad situations like Ape Canyon and the um, um, incident that Roosevelt. Uh, what was the guy's name? Bowman Bal- or uh, Bal- uh, the Bowman? Bal- yes. Yeah, Bowman. And <clears throat> that they have related to people where they've, uh, you know, had very uh, hostile experiences with them. But there seems to be an increasing amount of these experiences that are occurring. And I mean, it could be uh, due to the fact that we've got more people hiking, going out in the wilderness invading their territory so to speak but um the fact that they're coming into homes and i'm talking about homes that may have been in areas for a long long time and they're just like showing up and it's like okay we're taking over here i mean you hear that we've had that incident with carol uh i mean uh incidences like what i've got going on here i mean yeah my grandfather always told me that they were here but he never related to me that there was anything bad, you know, going on with them. Now, I think I told y'all that when my grandmother um, was having situations, I actually came 
<clears throat> came back from Alaska to take care of her because I had had the sheriff. They actually contacted me that they were really concerned about her well-being because uh, even though she was, I mean, the woman was in her 90s, but she was quite, you know, uh, quite healthy and got around and everything. But she was constantly calling them, telling them that they, she had um, window peekers. That somebody, she had men out here peeking in their windows. And you know what? I will honestly say that myself, my daughters, all of us just kind of went, you know, we kind of poo-pooed the whole idea. Yeah, it's just, it's just my, my grandmother. She's having, uh, you know, issues with dementia or something like that. Yet she really wasn't exhibiting any issues with dementia. And so that was what we were kind of, you know, oh, she's just an old lady and she's imagining things. She's fearful, yada, yada, yada. You know how that goes. Well, that was our excuse. But you know what, guys? I really wonder now if she really did have window peekers and they weren't of the human variety. So that kind of puts on a new spin for me because I've certainly had window peekers. So um, and they seem to want to do that a lot. Well, they want to know what we're doing. What you mentioned about these kinds of intrusions on, on the rise are, is correct because I've, uh, I was just thinking of a, a gentleman who listens to the show, uh, Mike, uh, it's, I won't say his last name, but uh, in East Texas, who's got this stuff happening right now, and it's actually very close to his home. He sent me pictures of his home and, and what they're doing, marking their territory right up behind his house, and he's hearing vocals and things, so... Um, I gave him some advice yesterday, and uh, <clears throat> that met- those methods should work, but they have to be employed, and otherwise the creatures will continue to ramp up that behavior. You know, I, I wonder if, if a lot of this is being caused by a population explosion with these things. I think that's because exactly it. Uh, you know, you we're finding all these baby tracks everywhere, and and obviously the numbers are increasing, and I just feel like maybe that's probably uh, why we're we're getting so many more different sightings and, and encounters in certain areas. Well, they've got tons of food, and they've got human behavior reversing what we've done for thousands of years. So they probably feel much more confident to do whatever they want to do in their own areas. Well, I think they're expanding their areas, too. And I think, you know, we've discussed this about a population explosion within them. And, you know, we are, we're, you know, humans are a good food source. And I'm not talking about as in uh, they're uh, eating us, which I don't, I would not hesitate to say that that might also be the case. But they're coming in. They've got our pets. They've got our livestock. They, and, you know, humans are not real good sometimes about disposing their garbage. And uh, we hear about them going through garbage cans, through dumpsters and all this sort of stuff. So we're, you know, even what grease traps with uh, Chuck up there in Oklahoma. So we're providing them. We're a great source of food. So that more food is going to make uh, mean, well, let's have more babies. We can have more babies. So uh, that's exactly what they do. The population's exploding. Our behavior has changed which like you pointed out, Will, uh, we're not hunting. We're not going out there and, and killing uh, like, you know, they just don't see us hunting anymore. They obviously have some idea, you know, that, that guns, you know, bring death and destruction. So they have some comprehension of that. And we're not doing that anymore. So, you know, they're thinking, hey, these naked apes are not really proving to be much of a, a you know, conflict for us or even uh, – you know, any type of danger to us. So, you know, they're taking advantage of it. They're primates. Primates are intelligent and they're going, Hmm, I can, I can, I can, I can work with this. I can, uh, you know, uh, get it to, uh, so that it's to my advantage. And that's exactly what they're doing. I know you know, here, whenever we had the pandemic, a lot of uh, cases were being reported because there weren't as many people in the woods. Well, that, well, that, makes, too, that makes sense to me. It's too bad they didn't come down with a good case of COVID. Right. Well, I will say that this area where we were at, uh, this, you know,
know, the wildlife management areas right there as well. And uh, I had a guy that uh, that I worked <laughs> with, and he told me a story. He he hunts out there a lot, bow hunts uh, deer se- during deer season. And uh, he told me a story one time where he was up in his blind, and um, a doe come running through there or walking through there, and he shot it with his bow, and he waited 15 or 20 minutes to to go and look for 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 the doe and he started following the blood trail out there and he got to a place where it looked like the doe had hit the ground and bled out uh, there was blood all over the ground uh, but the doe wasn't there uh, it was gone and that kind of mystified him a little bit and uh, he looked around and looked around for a while and, and finally found a blood spot on one of the leaves and was able to pick up the track again, uh, this blood trail. And it ended up, it went all the way back to his deer stand. The blood trail did. And when he got to the deer stand, there was a hindquarter laying on the ground. And the rest of the deer wasn't there. And if that ain't strange, I don't know what strange is. That's uh, creepy. Uh, yeah. Very creepy. It's like, okay, thanks for your di- for the dinner. Here's your here's your portion kind of thing going on. Um, oh, you know, here's another thing that I that has kind of I, I don't know, and I'm going to throw this one by Will, and maybe Forrest as well. And that is, quite often we see evidence that they kill things not for food, but for reasons known only to them. And, uh, you know, the, the, we've seen pictures of wild hogs, feral hogs in Texas that have, you know, it's been obviously is one of these things is a giant handprint on its side and its head has been dismembered without the use of tools and lots of other animals hanging in trees and that sort of thing. So I don't know. Uh, Will, what are your thoughts on that? Run the question by me again. Why is it that quite often they kill creatures or torture them, and it's not for food purposes? They just leave them, like that hog that was down in uh, Texas. You and I have a picture of it. Well, we don't know for sure why they do that, but uh, they have a vindictive streak that's very wide and short temper. So it could be, you know, depending on where <laughs> yeah. it is, you know, and, and what kind of people were nearby. You know, they could have felt slighted by anything and, and just started doing that stuff. Or they could be just, you know, damn nature serial killers and just go out and kill things. We don't know. Maybe taking out a frustration for something. What do you, th- well, what do you think first? Say, you know, this, well, I'm going to say, I think it kind of goes back to when I have made the comments before that they are so chimpanzee-like in their behavior. Um, and it kind of, I have seen, and of course I don't have firsthand knowledge of this. I wasn't there. I've actually seen video of chimpanzees and these are chimpanzees in zoo like situations that they've had other animals like raccoons or, um, ducks wander into their enclosures. I don't know how this happens, but it does. And the zookeepers, before they can get in there and prevent anything, they will watch. They they were horrified to see that these chimpanzees delighted in. I mean, literally, you could tell that they were enjoying killing these animals, dismembering the animals. They didn't kill, eat them. They just throw them around. They uh, you know pulled them apart and then left them. And I mean, the zookeepers were kind of like. Oh my gosh, you know, can you believe this behavior happens? Well, yes, you can believe it. I mean, my gosh, we've got serial killers that do the same thing in the uh, human serial killers that do the same thing to other humans. So, you know, we wonder sometimes uh, these shared behaviors and the shared DNA, what, uh, what else, you know, this is created. But obviously, I think that there's a possibility that just like Will said, the serial killers, uh, I think that there are those that occur in chimpanzees they've seen horrible behaviors and the way they've acted chimpanzees act in the wild 
towards humans and towards their own uh, troop mates. So, I mean, even in up to the point of cannibalism. So, um, you know, we share all this DNA and there's, we've got to admit that Bigfoot shares DNA too. How much of it they share, we don't know because as far as I know, nobody's ever actually run a legitimate DNA test on them to, uh, you know, prove how much, you know, shared DNA there is. But it, it's it's frightening when you think about it. The behavior is frightening. And I think people just need to start considering all these facts and just not go willy-nilly in the wilderness and uh, thinking that, you know, it's like I always say, we're not the alpha guys out there anymore. We're not the <laughs> the biggest and the meanest. There's something out there bigger and meaner than us. <clears throat> Silence. Well, yeah, silence, because we're thinking about it. <clears throat> it's a thrill kill. And, you know, wolves do the same thing. Wolves, a pack of wolves will go in and decimate a herd of elk or deer. And do they do it for food? No. As far as we can tell, they're just doing it as a thrill kill, just uh, entertainment. So are these things doing the same thing? I, I don't know. Sounds like it. Well, I mean, even and Tom, you and I have talked about, uh, you know, cats killing birds. I mean, I you had that incident occur the other day with you. I did, too. And I was, <laughs> you know, cat didn't kill the bird because uh, it wanted it was hungry. It just did it for the the. You know, it, it, I, I want to say instinctual, but I don't think that was, I don't think that played any part in it. Uh, other animals do exhibit this type of behavior, but it is few and far between. It's not something that's done on a regular basis. I think for some reason that Bigfoot seems to um, do this more than other primates do. Maybe even more than chimpanzees. You know, it's just not... Uh, I mean, we're not out there studying them and following a troop around because, first off, I don't think it would be a safe thing to do. So, and I mean, it, 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 you know, after I said what I did and it was complete total silence, I think it was just the idea going through everybody's mind. It's horrifying, guys. It it's is. Horrifying. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, guys, we're running low on time. Uh, any final thoughts before we wrap this session up? Chuck, did you have anything further you wanted to talk about? Or? Uh, that that was pretty much the encounter. And, uh, you know, I, uh, well, like I said, I hope I never have that feeling again. That's for sure. Um, you know, it, it was kind of a creepy, strange feeling that I've never felt before. And I, I just knew that we had to get out of there. Remember what we I'm say. I'm glad you got out of the cage, Chuck. Be, be careful what you no, wish for too. when you go out and do things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. That's it for this piece. Um, thanks for stopping by, everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open.